dynamic quantity. And so the way we're going to do that is to talk about the spontaneity of a chemical reaction. So a couple of weeks ago, we had, it was, it was really cold outside, uh, outside I'm, I'm looking at my pool right now outside. I had, I had, uh, the, the, the whole pool was uh, completely covered in ice. And as the temperatures warmed up, let's say the temperature got to 30, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, which is zero degrees Celsius. Does ice spontaneously melt at, at 32 degrees Celsius, at 32 degrees Fahrenheit? Yes, it does. It does. So what is driving that kind of a, of a process? So we say that when a reaction happens on its own, and you don't really have to do anything to it. We say that this is a spontaneous process. So a spontaneous process in chemistry, this proceeds on its own without a continuous external influence. OK, an example of this in the real world is skiing. So think of it this way. You're at the top of a you're at the top of a hill. You need you, you know, start doing the, the you start doing the French fries going down the hill. So that way, as you start going, you're picking up more and more speed. And eventually you get to the bottom of the hill. Now, keep in mind, you had to like put your spokes, you had to put your sticks in the snow and push you. So you had to provide a little bit of, of energy to make that happen. But even though you had to provide a little bit of energy, you the, the whole reaction or the whole process continued until you stopped. OK, now the opposite of a non spontaneous pro of a spontaneous process is a non spontaneous process where this only takes place in the presence of a continuous external influence. So that means you have to be doing something constantly to keep it going. So I have skiing as another example down here. So think of it this way. You're at the bottom of the hill now, okay? You've got to get back to the top. How do you get up there? You got two ways. Either one, you're going to start walking from the bottom of the hill to the top of the hill, which is a pain in the ass, let me tell you. Or you're going to get on a ski lift and you go from the, you know, from the bottom of the ski lift to the top using that uh, bottom of the hill to the top using that ski lift. Either way, you're constantly supplying some sort of energy to make this process happen, to get you from the bottom of the hill to the top of the hill. OK, so that's the difference between the two. A spontaneous process happens on its own. You might have to put a little bit of energy into it to make it go. But once the process starts, you don't have to supply any energy. It keeps going on its own. Non-spontaneous process, you always have to be co constantly doing something to make it happen. So if a reaction occurs spontaneously, we say that the system has an increase in the amount of molecular randomness. Okay, And so that's, that's kind of what we're talking about. Oh, by the way, when I, for these skiings, let me put downhill for the first one and then uphill for the second one. All right. So this thing, going back to molecular randomness, this new term is actually called entropy. And that's how we describe molecular randomness. And we represent entropy with a capital S. OK, and this is defined as the amount of molecular randomness in a system. OK, so the units for our entropy are going to be joules per Kelvin, which is way different than what we did for enthalpy. So enthalpy's units were kilojoules per mole. So right off the bat, enthalpy is going to be measured in kilojoules. This is going to be measured in joules. For entropy, there is also a temperature unit involved. So this entropy is going to be dependent upon temperature. OK, and so the way that we calculate a change in entropy, delta S, this would be equal to the final entropy value minus the initial entropy value. 
okay? And then when randomness increases, so as the sample becomes more and more random, okay, the entropy is a positive value, and when it becomes more ordered like a crystal, it's negative. So solids tend to have more order to them. So solids tend to have a negative value. Uh, gases, because there is no rhyme and reason to how gases behave. I mean, where the path of molecules and all that stuff, uh, the, the molecular randomness for a gas is usually going to be positive. Okay, so there are factors that describe the, that determine the spontaneity of a chemical or a physical change. The first is that we've got to look at the release or absorption of heat, and that's where the enthalpy comes in. Okay, the other thing that determines the spontaneity of a chemical or a physical process is the delta S. So there's delta H and delta S involved. Okay, so if we have a spontaneous process, to kind of summarize all this up, in order to have a spontaneous process, the enthalpy delta H should be negative because that describes an exothermic reaction. It's releasing energy. It's releasing heat. At the same time, the entropy value needs to be positive so that the way the molecules are random. All right. And if we have a non-spontaneous process, that means that the enthalpy has to be positive. So it's endothermic. Okay. And if it's non-spontaneous, there has to be a decrease in the ent entropy, so that has to be a negative value, so that's being more ordered. All right, so this spontaneous and non-spontaneous thing, this actually refers to another thermodynamic quantity called free energy. So that's how we actually measure spontaneity, by calculating this free energy thing. So how does entropy and enthalpy contribute to the overall spontaneity? We calculate, we use this thing called Gibbs free energy, delta G, to relate delta H to delta S along with the temperature. And we use an equation to calculate the Gibbs free energy. We say this, that delta G is going to be equal to delta H, the enthalpy, minus the product of the temperature times the change in entropy. Okay, so delta G again, that's your Gibbs free energy. And this is actually answering the question, how spontaneous is this process? Okay, so that's what delta G is actually answering. So if we calculate delta G, and delta G is less than zero, then the reaction is going to be spontaneous. So it happens on its own. Okay, so delta G has got to be negative. And if delta G is positive, then that means the reaction is non-spontaneous. So that means you're constantly supplying energy to me, or you're constantly supplying heat or something to an external influence to force this reaction to go. And if delta G is equal to zero, then we say that the reaction is at equilibrium, where the concentration of the products equals the concentration of the reactants. So this is a whole thing. Um, I, this is a really, really, really short version of what is going to be shown to you guys in Gen Chem 2. You're going to be talking about entropy quite a bit. You're also going to be talking about Gibbs free energy. How does this all play in? And then this whole thing about a system being at equilibrium. So this is actually one of the big ideas that comes out of Gen Chem 2. So before we go, we call we we say goodbye to thermochemistry for a minute, thermodynamics for the semester. Let's take a look at one more question. And here it is. Is the Haber process for the industrial synthesis of ammonia spontaneous or non-spontaneous under standard conditions at 25 degrees Celsius? At what temperature does the changeover occur? So this is actually asking us two parts. Part A, is this reaction spontaneous or non-spontaneous? And then part B, 
if it's not spontaneous or if it is spontaneous, when does that changeover actually happen? When does it go from one to the other? Okay. Now, what's kind of nice is that this problem is actually giving you the delta H and the delta S values. So that makes our life a lot easier. Okay. So delta H is going to be a negative 92.2 kilojoules. And then delta S is a negative 199 joules per K mole. So before we do anything else, and we got the chemical equation, because kilojoules for enthalpy and joules for entropy do not match, we've got to convert one of these to the other. So since enthalpy is the bigger of the two, let's convert the entropy to enthalpy. So doing that, we've got negative 199 joules per Kelvin. What I'm going to do is convert this to kilojoules. So one, we've got 1,000 joules per one kilojoule. So that's going to give us, that should give us a value of negative 0 0.199 kilojoules per Kelvin. Okay, so we've got that value. So for part A, we're going to take that Gibbs free energy equation, delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. Okay. And what we're going to do, and these are all at standard states, so I'm going to put those circles in, the superscripts. What I'm going to do is put in the values for enthalpy and entropy, and then let's let's solve. So enthalpy was negative 92.2 kilojoules, okay? Minus T, the temperature was at 25 degrees Celsius. Now, since entropy has Kelvin as the unit, that means that this temperature must be converted to Kelvin. So we're looking at 298 Kelvin. Again, we just took that temperature at 25 and added 273 to get 298. So that's 298 Kelvin times the entropy, negative 0 0.199 kilojoules per Kelvin. Okay, so that way the Kelvin units cancel out and we got kilojoules for both of these. We're good. So uh, if you take 298 times negative uh, negative 0.199, so let me do that, 298 times negative 0.199, that value comes out to be negative 59.302. So negative 92.2 minus a negative 59.302, so we're basically adding it, plus 59.302, that should give us a value of negative 32.898 kilojoules. Okay, now since delta G is negative, according to what we have, that means that this reaction is spontaneous as written. So that means we have to supply a little bit of energy, and then it should go on its own. That's pretty cool. So here's part B. At what temperature does this changeover occur? Okay. Now, to get us to this point, we've got to solve, we've got to think about this a little bit. We need delta G to be greater than zero because then it's non-spontaneous. So what we're going to do is rearrange this equation. We're going to actually solve for when delta G is equal to zero because then the reaction's at equilibrium. And if we go any temperature higher, than zero than than whatever that number is, then that means whatever temperature is higher, that's got to be the changeover. So I'm going to rewrite this equation and put delta G is equal to zero. So delta G is equal to zero, and that's equal to delta H minus T delta S. Now we're going to solve for temperature. Okay, so I need to get temperature by its own. So I've got to add, I've got to subtract uh, delta H from both sides, okay? So if I subtract both sides, uh, delta H from both sides, that gives me negative delta H. On the left-hand side, side, this is equal to negative T delta S. And so what I'm going to do is divide both sides by negative delta S. And the reason why I'm doing that, that way the negative signs cancel out and I'm left with temperature. So the equation that I want to deal with, the temperature where this changeover is going to occur is going to be delta H divided by delta S. 
Okay, so if I put in the values that I got, 92.2, negative 92.2 kilojoules, and that's okay. The negative signs are going to cancel each other out. So, and then the delta S was negative 0.199 kilojoules per Kelvin. Okay, so negative 92.2 divided by negative 0.199 that value comes out to be 463 Kelvin. So at that temperature, okay, at 463 Kelvin, we're at an equilibrium. But if we go up one more degree at 464 Kelvin, we're above zero for delta G. And now the reaction becomes non-spontaneous. But if we go down two more degrees to 462, the reaction is still spontaneous. So that's kind of cool that at just a couple degrees will change a reaction from being spontaneous to non-spontaneous.